So today's reading is from Luke chapter 7, verses 18 to 35. John's disciples told him about all these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, illnesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. Yeah, sorry, yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. Jesus went on to say, to what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other. We played the pipe for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not cry. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is proved right by all her children. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me explain what this is about. It could be a prop. It could be a visual aid. Uh, when the vicar's been struggling, he normally has a glass of hot Ribena. But I'm reaching a new stage of life where I might need this. Um, some of you know that I was, I was struggling with a cold for three or four weeks over the last three or four days. It went to my ear and made me a bit dizzy. So I've been on the penicillin. I haven't fallen over yet. Uh, but this is here just in case I need to steady myself and sit down. Uh, last week, I, uh, Sylvia was <laughs> offering me her crutch. That would do as well. But I think you need that. So uh, this, I was preaching last, was it last Sunday morning I was preaching? And I just felt a little bit lightheaded and found myself having to do that. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's what this is about. Uh, praise God that his work among us is not dependent on how well any of us are. Uh, but as Paul said, his grace is made perfect in our weakness. So let's pray that he'll speak to us tonight. We praise you, Lord Jesus, that your grace is enough for each one of us in all the things we face. And for me as I preach this evening, come by your Holy Spirit and take the words I've prepared and speak through them, supremely take the words of Scripture and speak through them. Speak to each one of us through this uh, sort of dialogue between Jesus and John the Baptist's disciples and we pray there would be something you say to each one of us that will take us closer to you. And we offer it all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is a sermon of two halves. The first half is John the Baptist's question to Jesus. The second half is what Jesus said about John the Baptist. Uh, it's not one of those sermons with one clear, sharp focus uh, point. When I'm trying to train preachers, I always say try and have one main point. Uh, if you're not clear what you're saying, no one else will have a clue. Uh, but actually, I've got lots of points tonight, and it's more like scattering grape shot. And I don't expect any of you to remember all of it. I never do. Uh, but I do pray that God will speak one thing at the least to you. And it may be from the first half, or it may be from the second half, and I shan't tell you how many points there are. That's for you. You only need to hear one. 
Uh, so first of all, John the Baptist's question to Jesus. And as we approach this, what do you do when you have a serious question about your faith? I might just perch on the end. I might like preaching from here. I think Jesus sat down to teach, didn't he, from time to time. Perhaps it's another way I'll become like Jesus. I'll sit down to teach. I haven't got many of Jesus' commands cracked. Uh, my family say there's one I've got just about sorted, which is don't worry about what you wear. I've nearly got that one cracked. Uh, not entirely, but maybe sitting down to teach will be like Jesus. That'd be another way. Anyway, I quite like this. Uh, so what do you do uh, when you have a serious question about your faith, when you're wondering if you can really trust God or when you're wondering if it's all true? Because it seems that behind John the Baptist's question is a, are you really who I thought you were? Uh, remember John the Baptist, he's Jesus' cousin. He was filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. He had led a national revival. The crowds had flocked out to him. He was clear and uncompromising. He had baptized people with forgiveness of sins. And he was very clear that he was a signpost to Jesus. He was just pointing the way. Uh, after me comes someone much greater than me. I'm not worthy to untie their sandals or in today's idiom, I'm not worthy to lick their boots. I'm pointing to someone who is far greater. Uh, John the Baptist was very clear about all of that. Uh, in John chapter 3, verse 29 to 30, we read this that he said. Have we got very good? Uh, John said this, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it's now complete. He, that's Jesus, must become greater. I must become less. So John had had this life full of the Holy Spirit, leading a national revival, pointing to Jesus. And as Jesus' ministry took off, John melts into the background. Uh, it's happened. John has become less. He still has some disciples. He's still presumably pointing them to Jesus. His ministry has shrunk, but it's reached the point uh, where it's no longer public because he's been arrested and put in prison. Uh, it's always good just to compare the different Gospels with each other. And in Matthew's version of this, we read this. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? It wasn't just that John couldn't be bothered to go and ask Jesus himself. Uh, he couldn't get there. He couldn't text him. He couldn't pick up the phone. He couldn't email him. Uh, and can you picture John who's led a national revival, who was sure Jesus was the Messiah, who knew his Old Testament scriptures really well, that said, when the Messiah comes, all will be made new. He'll usher in a new age and everything will be made new. And he sees Jesus' ministry, but it doesn't look like everything's been made new. It's all rather quieter. And here he is in prison, and John is utterly human, and he had his doubts. Are you really the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Uh, so back to Luke, because we're really preaching through Luke, uh, and uh, much the same, Luke, verses 18 to 20. Let's look at this. So John's disciples told him about the things Jesus had been doing. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Uh, when the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Uh, whatever is going on in John's mind goes to Jesus with the question. The first thing I want to say, and it may be this is what you need to hear, is that if you've got a serious question about your faith, the very best place you can go is to Jesus with it, not away. Uh, what I notice is when people sometimes are struggling, they start keeping their distance a bit. They don't read their Bible so much. They don't pray so much. They don't come to church so much. John sends his question to Jesus uh, straight up. Uh, the Bible's full of hard questions to God. The Psalms ask God the hard questions full on. Please, if you're struggling with any question about your faith, bring it to Jesus. Bring it to the Scriptures. You're never going to find the answer somewhere else. Uh, the added advantage of this, of course, is it directs John's disciples to Jesus themselves. And Jesus answers this question uh, 
not directly. He very rarely answers a direct question directly. Uh, but he points them to the evidence. Have a look at what's going on around you. So at that time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits. He gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Jesus takes them to the evidence. Now, I remember as a teenager when I was struggling um, do I believe this is true or do I not believe it's true? I grew up in a Christian home, as many of you know. My teenage years were probably my worst years spiritually. I was torn two ways. But one of the very, very significant points in those teenage years was hearing a talk on the evidence for the resurrection. I thought, oh my goodness, this is true. It holds up. And if you're struggling with your faith, look at the evidence. Look at the Gospels. Uh, they're there to help us know who Jesus is. Look at the evidence for the resurrection, for what Jesus did. Of course, there was no evidence of the resurrection uh, at this point. <laughs> Jesus hadn't been raised. But there's plenty of evidence uh, what the Old Testament says will happen when the Messiah comes. And Jesus knew that John knew his Bible well. Uh, let me just read to you a couple of things from Isaiah. Here's Isaiah 35, 5 to 6. Then, in the great days when God makes everything new, then will the eyes of the blind be open and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. You get, it's just one of many pointers to what will happen in the great day when God makes everything new. Or Isaiah 61, similarly. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has appointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. So Jesus goes around proclaiming good news, healing, cleansing, all signs that point to uh, the age to come and says to John, go and tell him what you see. Now, of course, what we know that John didn't know was that the kingdom broke in in two stages. The Jews thought that there was this age, the Messiah would come, and then it would be the age to come when everything would be perfect. It's one reason many Jews don't believe in Jesus, because they know that when Messiah comes, everything will be made perfect. And clearly, since Jesus has arrived, everything is not yet perfect. So some Jews would say that's why they don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. But Jesus came in a two-stage fulfillment. He broke in with his life and they ushered in the start of the kingdom, but it won't be fully here until he comes again. And John didn't, couldn't possibly have known that. So Jesus points John to the signs of the kingdom and basically says, trust me, trust me. So that's John's question to Jesus. And if you have questions to Jesus, for some of you it's about looking for the evidence, for some of you it's about coming to Jesus, for some of you it may be something else I've said. Uh, what then about what Jesus says about John, the second half of this story? Because after John, Jesus has sent John's disciples back to him with the message, uh, he then talks to the crowd around him uh, about what's going on. So let's uh, pick up verses 24 to 27 of our passage. So after John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in five clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury in palaces. What did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, more than a prophet. The one on whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Uh, you will notice, if you're reading through the Gospels, how Jesus often answers a question with a question. And it's not normally to be obtuse. It's normally to tease out more understanding. Uh, sometimes it is to deflect. I love it that Jesus could sidestep difficulty. Uh, we'll get to it in due course. But I love that when the authorities were trying to pin Jesus down with, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus just answers them another question. Uh, anyone got a coin? Whose head is on this? 
Caesar's. Oh, well, give to Caesar what's Caesar's and to God what's God's. I love the fact that Jesus can sidestep stuff. Uh, but normally when he asks a question, it's to draw out further understanding. And Jesus uses this opportunity to talk more about John and how remarkable he was. Now, remember that John had been filled with the Spirit from birth. So if there's ever a person uh, who could demonstrate much of what godly character is, it would be John. And there's three things here about John that Jesus pulls out for us. And I think we all need more of all three of these. Uh, he wasn't swayed by the prevailing winds. What did you go out to see? Someone blown around, a reed blown around by the winds? No, John, utterly uncompromising. He was clear about what he believed. People went out because they wanted to hear what they believed God was saying through him. It is so easy for us to be blown around by all the different things that everybody else thinks. In the West, the church is probably at its weakest up against the court of public opinion. We are afraid of what people think. We find it hard to stand true to what the scriptures say. And we easily get blown around by the breeze. And John is a wonderful example of someone who stayed firm. And for some of us, this will be the thing that the Lord's need to say to us tonight. Pray to God to fill you afresh with his spirit so you can stand firm for him, even when you have to say things that are unpopular or difficult. Pray for the Church of England as a whole in this huge debate about marriage. Are we going to stay firm to what God has revealed in his scriptures? Or are we going to be blown around by the prevailing winds of public opinion? Uh, this really matters. We need the Spirit of God. Without the Spirit of God, we'll probably be a reed blown in the wind. There's one thing. Here's a second one. Uh, he wasn't materialistic. What did you go out to see? Someone wearing fancy clothes? No. no. Far from it. John wore very basic clothes and had a very basic diet. He wasn't in the least materialistic. And here is an example of someone Jesus tells us not to seek after material things, but to seek fast first God's kingdom and his righteousness and to trust him. Uh, if I cross-reference Matthew 6, 33, this is after Jesus is talking about trusting God with our material needs. Jesus says, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. And for some of you tonight, I think that is what the Lord is saying. Are you going to seek first Jesus and his kingdom and trust that he will provide for your needs or are you going to make sure you provide for your needs and God gets a look in if there's any spare time uh, John was a really great example of someone who definitely put God first and was not materialistic and here's the third thing about John that Jesus says he was a messenger verse 27 uh, John is the one about whom it's written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. As we started off saying, John was a signpost. He pointed to Jesus. Often when he's portrayed in art, you see him with his finger out, pointing to Jesus. And this is our job. We are called to point people to Jesus. Uh, we're heading for Ascension Day. You know that. Ascension Day is our church's birthday. Our foundation stone, however old the stone was, Eleanor, very impressive, uh, was laid 150 years ago. Uh, our first service was on Ascension Day 149 years ago. Ascension time is the time when Jesus says to his disciples, wait for the Holy Spirit. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be my witnesses or my messengers. And I think we all need to pray this for ourselves more. Even if you're good on not being blown around by what others think about you, even if you're really good on not being materialistic, and most of us have got some work on both of those things, all of us are called to be messengers, to point people to Jesus. And we won't do it on our own strength. If you try and do it in your own strength, it usually goes horribly wrong. We need Jesus to fill us with his spirit so we overflow and point others to him. And as we're heading for this ascension weekend i am praying increasingly that god will pour his spirit afresh on us as a church 
and on us as individuals and equip us to do what John the Baptist did, to point people to Jesus more effectively. I'm expecting some new ministries to bubble up as God calls this person or that person into a new way of maybe a, 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 a new ministry, it may be a new worshipping community, it may be a new way of engaging with people such that we can proclaim the good news of Jesus to uh, this generation we're in. Uh, I see I've put in the notes that verse from Acts 1.8, so let's have it up on the screen. There we are. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Well, John the Baptist supremely was someone filled with the Spirit who pointed people to Jesus. Uh, finally, there's a bit more at the end of this passage. I said it was a sermon in two halves, but really there's a bit more at the end. Uh, where Jesus talks about the reaction to John's ministry and to his. And he explains how people are divided into two. All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they'd been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purpose themselves because they hadn't been baptized by John. And Jesus went on to say, to what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They're like children sitting in a marketplace calling out to each other, we played the pipe for you and you didn't dance, we sang a dirge and you didn't cry. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine and you say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and you say here's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So what's all that about? Jesus divides people into two, for him and against him, much the same as John the Baptist did. And the people who were for John the Baptist's ministry wound up being for Jesus' ministry. And the people who were against John the Baptist's ministry wound up being against Jesus' ministry. Because what's going on is if our heart is to, for God, the more light that is shone, the more we're drawn to it. And if our heart goes against God, we're proud and sinful, the more we turn our back from it. Uh, I love these verses in John 3 that explains it really well. This is the same bit where uh, John the Baptist, the same bit John 3 where John's saying he must increase but I must decrease. Uh, Jesus says this, Light has come into the world but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be, be seen plainly what they've done has been done in the sight of God. In other words, God shines his light and those God is drawn to himself get drawn to the light, just presumably as you are drawn to the light this evening. And others turn their back on it. And the people who turned their back on John the Baptist turned their back on Jesus for entirely different reasons outwardly. They said to John about John the Baptist, he must have a demon. He doesn't eat anything normal. He doesn't drink anything normal. He's very odd. He must be demonic. Jesus comes eating and drinking and partying, and they say, oh, he's a glutton and a friend of sinners. It doesn't really matter. If they're against him, they'll find an excuse. If they're for him, they'll be drawn to him. And when you and I and we as a church point people to Jesus, there will be one of those two reactions. Some people will be drawn to him, and we praise God that that is happening day by day, week by week. Others will turn their backs on him. And as witnesses to Jesus, our job is to shine a bit of light. If people respond to that light positively, we can shine a bit more and tell them more. If they reject a little bit of light, then there's no point banging on about it. Just move on. So here is Jesus and John the Baptist. Uh, what's the one thing that Jesus has said to you tonight? Is it to take your questions and come to him? Is it a sort of almost a perverse encouragement that if John had his questions and his doubts, okay, maybe it's not too bad for me to have my questions and my doubts, bring them to Jesus. Is it prayer for the Holy Spirit to fill you afresh so that you're not blown around by, by what others think? Instead, come to the scriptures and get rooted deeply in the truth of the scriptures? Is it you compromised materially? Have you learned to trust God for your material needs yet? To trust him with your finances? 
Uh, is that the thing? Or is it about being witnesses to Jesus? There are many, many things. Let me finish with what a privilege we have. Verse 28, Jesus says this. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Now that's an extraordinary privilege that we have. Humanly, John the Baptist is up there and we're, we're not worthy to lick his boots. But we have this extraordinary privilege of being part of God's kingdom. Not because we deserve it, but by grace. Uh, so that's a good point for us to pray. I wonder if the band would like to come back and if you'd like to stand. And I rather like sitting here to preach. Who knows, this might, be, might become a thing. We'll, we'll see how that goes, but I'll stand up to pray. Lord, how we praise you for your Holy Spirit. And we pray that you would come afresh by your Spirit this evening on us individually, on us as a church. Come, Holy Spirit, and minister more deeply to us. Take the word that you've spoken and take it deep down. Come, Holy Spirit. Let's just keep still for a minute. Pray for any here tonight struggling with questions. And I pray, Lord, for courage to come to you, to read the scriptures, to talk with Christian friends. Pray you answer those questions. Pray for those who are blown around by what others think. Lord, all of us have this to a greater or lesser extent. We pray for grace to engage well with people in the world around, but stay firmly rooted in the truth of your word, that it would be bedrock to us and we'd be able to stand firm in a society that has increasingly turned its back on you. Pray for grace to trust you with our material needs. Lord, promises to provide for those. Always worth saying, if you need help, we have a hardship fund. But we pray for grace for all of us, Lord, to trust you materially. And then we pray, come in increasing power by your Spirit, not least as we approach this Ascension weekend, and equip us as St. Paul's Church to be effective witnesses to Jesus. That we would be better as a church at witnessing to you than at any point in our 150 year old history. We pray for a new era of mission and evangelism, of being like John the Baptist, of pointing people to Jesus. So come Holy Spirit, minister deeply to us and overflow through us. We're going to sing the song in a moment, I Speak Jesus. We pray that you would so fill us that we do wind up speaking Jesus to those around. As we sing, continue your ministry among us by your spirit. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.